What's up fellow gamers, Freak here, and this is another sort of standalone, I guess, video. Uh, I really enjoy musing on design concepts. In another life, I would try to be a game designer. No idea if I'd be good, but it's fun to think about. Um, and don't have to risk being bad because I don't do any work there. Uh, regardless, though, it's something that I find really interesting, really fun. And so this is um, this video started out as me noodling on should mythic items like you know, Gale Force and uh, Eclipse and Luden's Tempest. I mean, most of them deal damage. Uh, should they scale in damage? Should they scale by level? Should they scale with AD, AP, and health ratios? Like what, you know, why and how should they and should they not and what's going on there? And as I kind of like looked into it and thought about it myself, I realized that I needed to answer a different question first, which is what was even the point of the items in the first place? And so this is a video uh, that is largely scripted that is about uh, item design in League of Legends. In fact, the title is there and there. Uh, so you can really sure uh, be sure that it's item design in League of Legends. And what I discovered as I was making this, this video is I was scripting it and... Uh, about three and then four drafts in, I realized that I was going to keep editing this thing forever and decided that I'd rather just get something out there. And so even though there are caveats I would want to bring up and other things I want to, you know, maybe change at some point, I think this is good enough. And I'm going to basically be moving forward on slides while basically just reading a script and hopefully this ends up being a fairly enjoyable experience. The visuals are not terribly important if you would rather, like, you know, look away to something else, that's fine. But I'm going to start the script now. And so... Let's have fun with this one. So, as I said, this started out with me asking how hard mythic items should scale. And honestly, I'm not answering that in this video anymore. Instead, I'm asking a new one, which is what makes item design in League of Legends good? Now, fundamentally, I believe game design is about getting players to make choices. Now, this is a sentence that you could debate, but let's just assume I'm right for now and move on. This means in order to design any system into a game, it has to present players with choices or make the choices they already have better. Maybe make them more meaningful, make them more accessible, but something to make player choice elevate. You also need to understand when designing what kind of a game you're making, what kind of a genre you're in. Some games can let you take a while to make a decision. In a single player strategic turn-based game like XCOM, you can look as long as possible. Um, you can look at all your targets, look at your chance to hit, look at your damage range, figure out if you can knock that target down, or not before their turn? Can you move before the shot? Are there good places to take cover? Can that spot get flanked? Can I get to full cover? Or can I risk taking only half cover because they'll die in time? And a unit's turn is only two clicks in XCOM. It's one to move and one to fire. But figuring out the relevant squad mate to do it with and the relevant enemy to shoot at and which ability to use on them, that can take a really long time to figure out which two clicks to make. But that decision, figuring that all out, is the fun. And XCOM surfaces all that data to you. Here are your sight lines, here's full and half cover, here's your chance to hit, here's your abilities. And yeah, you might have this for every squad mate every round, but that's the fun of the game. We're talking about League of Legends, though. It is a real-time game, and neither you nor your opponents or your allies are going to wait for you, so you have to make decisions quickly. That means math cannot be done, googling answers mid-game cannot be done, and so when designing for a real-time game like League, you have to make the, the differences and the decisions obvious as possible, and let players choose quickly. So in this video, I'll be talking about how I think the item design is done well, and a couple areas I think it can improve. Alright, so that was the slide we're supposed to have. I'll do better next time. Part one, items are about progression. League of Legends is fun because of progression. Its items need to simultaneously fill two purposes, vertical progression and horizontal progression. And I'm pretty sure I'm using these terms correctly. Vertical progression is about getting stronger because your numbers went up. A champion with 1,000 health is stronger than one with 500 health, and there's no debate to that. 300 attack damage is more than 100 attack damage. 80 ability power is more than 20. Now, there is a tangent here about why and how vertical progression works and the extent that should exist in the game, but let's just stop and say that indeed vertical progression is part of the fun and the items help supply that. We're not saying why, we're saying that it happens and, and I agree that it does and, and should. Horizontal progression, meanwhile, is about getting new options. In Elise, who can cast Cocoon is objectively stronger than one who can't, but hey, if the target's under Black Shield, that doesn't matter. A champion may have bought Serpent's Fang so they can deal bonus damage to the Janna Shields, but while they're locked in a combat with Dr. Mundo, there's no difference in that item than any other amalgamation of items that gives 60 attack damage and 18 lethality. 
A Bramble Vest helps a lot when fighting against Fiora, and as Maokai, I'd rather have one than not, but Azir ignores that item completely. This is horizontal progression. You are certainly more powerful in the abstract, but those strengths are specific, and they can sometimes even be completely ignored. League of Legends in items, and really I would say every part of the game, strives to give players both of these things simultaneously. There are, again, plenty of reasons why, but again, not the point of the video. So, the primary thing that items do, the primary thing they have are components, and they have basically primary stats. So first of all, items are two key components, and the first of which are primary stats. Simple additive stats. They're really easy to look at and really easy to understand. 100 attack damage plus 100 attack damage is 200 attack damage. 100 more attack damage than that is 300 attack damage. I'm not blowing any minds here. I'm just stating really obviously what this point is about. And what I like most about this is that they are simple and easy to understand. They are stats the game gives you right up front. They're on every single champion's you know, status bar. Um, every single champion in League of Legends has a basic attack. Every single champion has a health bar. Every champion has attack damage or ability power ratios. If every item you buy gives you attack damage or ability power, you're continuing to grow in a linear fashion, dealing more damage, shielding more potently, or doing whatever your output is more strongly. The third obvious core stat that I talked about, of course, is health. Many tanks scale offensively off of health as well in some way. I probably think more of them should do this, but again, that is another tangent that we're not going to dive into too much. But I want to put out that I really, really, really like linear stat scaling because it still satisfies the vertical growth urge that players have while playing a game like this, while also somewhat lowering the snowball potential of the game. In general, these stats sort of fall off, and I'll use some examples here. If we increase our attack damage from 100 to 200, we're probably killing someone in half the time. If we increase it to 300, that's almost certainly not the case anymore. For example, a target has 1,000 health. If we go from 100 AD to 200 AD, we go from taking 10 attacks to taking 5 attacks. If we increase to 300 AD, we only go from 5 attacks down to 4. There's even numbers where it doesn't even do anything if they have between 301 and 400 health. 100 damage to 200 damage, 4 hits becomes 2 hits, and then 200 to 300 damage, 2 hits remains two hits. Um, despite the fact that you're obviously more powerful, you have more AD, it doesn't necessarily always change the time to kill. Now, it, instead, if every item only ever multiplied what came before it, you might have the problem of one big hyper carry with a single item just crushing everybody in every single fight, because how could you stop them? Everything doubled what came before it, and there are two champions in one already. Now, yes, of course, some snowballing does need to exist, and again, that is a different topic that can be covered at a different time, but one way to keep track of snowball, or at least keep it in check a bit, is to keep a lot of the gold budget of an item in linear scaling stats that, in a way, sort of fall off. The other part about this baseline of stats that I really like is it helps insulate around bad choices or even just really, really difficult choices where it's impossible to make the right call every time. To be clear, I do want players to make tough choices. Do I buy Death's Dance because Kane is fed? Do I buy a Mortal Reminder because Kane is fed? Or do I, do I buy Rapid Fire Cannon so I can stay out of range because Kane is fed? Sure, I'm kind of being hyperbolic here, but the point still stands that, okay, we're probably an AD carry here, we're probably going into our third item of the build, and you kind of implicitly understand none of these items are traps. None of them are trash on a basic level. They all do pretty good things, but which one do you do with your next 3,000 gold? Where do you go? That's a hard call to make. And even if you thought you made the right call and didn't, or Kane is just so fed that Death's Dance didn't keep you alive anyway... The nice thing is you still gained a bunch of stats that are useful no matter what's going on. And I think that's really, really important. And it's important because I think you should be rewarded for first blood. You should be rewarded for farming well. You should be rewarded for knocking down turret plates. If the only items I can buy give armor and nothing else, a lane swap with Fiora and Azir rids me of my entire gold advantage. And I don't think that's okay. That sort of punishment can be good in very, very small doses, but I am glad items like Trinity Force are useful against everyone. Not every item should be Bramble Vest. It's also something that I like about completed items in League of Legends. In general, they are mostly the same cost. They give roughly the same stats, and they are often equally gold efficient. So you're mostly shopping for their unique text. I again think that is a positive thing. 
you shop for aqueous unique passes that are hard to quantify, but everything else along the way is relatively efficient. So, as I said, items have two components, unsexy linear progression and interesting unquantifiable uniques. Even the most quantifiable uniques tend to be interesting. Ravidan's Death Cap has two lines of text, and it's that simplicity that tells you how cool it is. It's nothing but a big stack of ability power, and, and so much so that it multiplies all the other items you already have. Without doing virtually any math, you can tell this is the biggest stack of AP you could get. Just, you know, probably don't buy it first. That's easy enough to do. That's not a problem. But you can do many things that aren't just stack of ability power, even if all they do is provide damage. There are a bunch of play-altering items like Lichbane and Nasher's Tooth, which make you care about basic attacks suddenly. They can even inspire champion mechanics like Victor, who discharges with his Q and his auto, or Kale, who's an AP auto attacker. Void Staff also just adds a bunch of damage, but it only really does it against tanks. Zonia's Hourglass is a hugely impactful item. Shirelia's and Turbo Chem Tank provide hard engage tools when your team may have been lacking them. Gale Force gives AD carries burst that they didn't have before. These are meaningful contributions that should be eye-opening and satisfying to quest after. And those are designed well. Unique passives and actives are the core design element of completed items in League of Legends. Virtually every single one has them. You build a bunch of mostly boring components... That's good, and they culminate in some kind of mostly horizontal power. That's good. You're playing a champion, you're playing a keystone rune a little bit, and you're playing up to five unique bonuses provided exclusively by the items you chose and nowhere else. This, I think, is how Riot keeps League fresh and how each game remains a unique experience. Even if you play the same champion 20 times in a row, you're probably not playing the same items 20 times in a row. I think Riot has tried, and I think they've been fairly successful, at trying to keep items to one unique benefit per slot. There's exceptions, absolutely. I would like if there were fewer, but it's what it is. Even the ones that just do the things with their components, like Executioner's Calling and Oblivion Orb and Bramble Vest, they just do that thing better on upgrade. It's still that item. Uh, this means outside of your Mythic and Boots, you have to pick which four special things you get to do this game. And there are certainly more than four options out there. I think it's a really well-built space. When can you reduce healing? When can you immune damage? When can you revive? When can you delay 30% of physical damage output? When can you get a spell shield on top? You have to choose four, and you have to choose an order. This is always compelling if the components are in line, because that's a hard choice to make every single time. As an aside, I think Seraph's Embrace is actually ruined by the fact that there's so much mana in the game and that half the Mage Mythics provide so much mana. I think mana as a system is a necessary constraint. Running out of resources is an important part of the game pacing. Champions whose resource refills quickly, you know, like energy, are limited in other ways, right? Akali and Kennen run out of juice really, really fast and then have to wait to recharge. And they can never buy anything to alleviate that certainty. But you as a mana user are given the opportunity to alleviate or maybe even ignore mana constraints. And often, this costs you something. Tear the Goddess is 400 gold of no combat stats. You don't kill faster, you don't live longer, you're just stacking up a horde of 600 mana. And then you upgrade to Muramana or Seraphs. 850 or more to do a big chunk of AD or AP for your troubles. And yeah, you've doubled your mana pool. No one's going to stop you. That's actually pretty decent. But, or I should say, while we're continuing on, with everything tuned correctly, this really could be satisfying. I mean, think about ta champions like Talon and Malphite. Um, these champions almost never buy extra mana, and they are completely fully functional champions. Even Jace has fluctuated back and forth over time with buying Mana Mune and not. Now, sure, these stacking mana items are not necessarily bad when completed, but the problem is, and the difficulty is, they are competing against other unique passives. You opt into a power trough of buying a tier and nothing else, but at the end of the day, you get your stats back and you come out being able to mostly ignore costs. Maybe you had to sacrifice healing reduction. Maybe you don't have percent arm penetration. That's okay, though. You made a choice to hit the double your mana pool and can spam to your heart's content. I think this is a totally fine decision to make, and it's one that's worth supporting. Honestly, I'd like to go further. I'd like to see Riot... Uh, have a tank version of Tear and remove Glacial Shroud. But let's go back to Seraph's Embrace and what I think the problem is. Seraph gets undercut because Luden's Tempest, Leander's Anguish, and Everfrost all give 600 mana. And then there's more mana giving runes like a Mana Flow Band and Presence of Mind. So Seraph's is not they're really a mechanically weak item. It's functional, its stats are fairly efficient, it actually has a lot of ability power on it. But ironically, 
because of the 850 bonus mana you get from going Ludens and Mana Flow, yes, it technically feeds into the AP of Seraphs, but it undercuts the reason you buy Seraphs, which is mana. Um, yeah, sure, it might even be the optimal choice in several mana using Rages, but it's still not satisfying because it does nothing unique by itself. It does nothing that stands out. It's just not exciting. It doesn't provide anything unique. Literally, its unique passives are more ability power, which is done more excitingly on Death Cap, and more mana, which is done kind of for free, or certainly more conveniently, on Mythics and Runes. AD champions get an overtuned on hit effect, and crucially, they don't have the other mana options. I haven't seen a single Ezreal in preseason complain that Triforce and Divine Sunderer don't have mana on them. All Ezreal wanted was enough mana to spam Q, which Mana Muna gives, and so he's happy. But sadly, mana stacking as a system isn't compelling by itself either, even when there were more items that did it. It just meant that you followed the same linear build path of Rod of Ages and Seraphs and then sometimes Lich Bane if your stats could afford it or your, your combat pattern could afford it. For everyone else, they would just happen to randomly pick up mana because it happened to be on the items they bought. Now, there is a further discussion around finding a way for players to fine-tune resource generation needs, but that is another tangent that we're not going to go down. Let me summarize my overall thoughts on Seraphs, though. I think Riot needs to figure out what Seraphs is supposed to uniquely provide. I don't think the mana stacking play star was ever deep because you just bought the same two or three items. You just had champions who bought those items for making choices and happened to scale off of mana. I think every unique item you build needs to make you say, okay, I can do this thing now. I can survive a Cinder ultimate because I have Mob Memortius. I can chase down Trindomir after his ult and spin with Gale Force. I can get my team to engage on the Poke Comp with Shirelius. I can immune the Fizz Shark with Zonius. I can cut the Soraka's healing so that we can kill the Djinn with Thornmail, Morellos, or any of the other Grievous Wounds items. They are all unique specific benefits and they provide a lot. A major horizontal growth lets you do something that you couldn't do before. It might not be relevant in every fight and it might not be relevant in every game. Zonius doesn't deal any damage. You may just die when you come out, but sometimes it buys time for Tom Kench to come over or for Playful Trickster to come off of cooldown. And that is where those items shine, and I think where Seraphs is dull. Now, I said items have two components. They have the boring linear growth, and they have the sexy, unique passives. I lied because they have a third component. They have complementary stats. Uh, the primary components are attack damage, ability power, and health. And every single champion wants at least one, likely two, and occasionally all three. From there, they apply those stats in different ways, and that's where complementary stats come into play. Let's say you're a tank. You want health, and you're going to absorb a lot of hits. But it's important that you answer whose hits you're tanking. Is it Trindomir? Well then, you should buy a health item with armor on it. Are you trying to survive a Kali? Then a health item with magic resist. And that's really good because it narrows it down. Ah, Thornmail, Randuin's... Dead Man's Plate, Zeke's Conversions. Those are the four items with health and armor on them. What you're actually shopping for is now the unique passive. They all have good rationale behind them. These are not easily directly quantifiable across one another. And those comparisons are meaningful. I've already talked about why unique passives and actives are cool. So let's talk about the issue I have with these items and talk more about secondary stats. Um, for whatever reason, these items give differing levels of health and armor. Now, can you, right now, tell me if 250 health and 80 armor is better or worse than 475 health and 40 armor? I mean, maybe you could, and it's certainly possible, but can anyone do that in the middle of a game without a spreadsheet? I mean, math problems don't make for interesting items, and they really don't make sense in a real-time game like League of Legends. The four are all different, but those stats seem different for difference's sake, which, I don't know, maybe is valuable, and that's something you could explore, but again, a tangent for another time. You also have items like Frozen Heart, which only has armor and no health at all. And I'll tell you, I've almost never brought Frozen Heart because tanks actually need health to function. Now, I think that is a miss from the item design. Uh, you're spending money on mana, which also feels kind of bad. Uh, somehow, the mana items for tanks exclusively have armor on them. Um, and Ability Haste, because Glacial Shroud is an item still. Uh, I don't know why mana-hungry tanks can't enjoy fighting AP champions, but you don't have a choice because... Some stats are irreparably bound in kind of poor ways. And so, new thought though, is that consistency, and look, occasional misses in the consistency aside, I think secondary stats serve three incredible purposes, the first of which you already touched on. 
Okay, let's talk about them. First, it helps tell you what the item is about. Health and armor are the stats I want when I fight Trindamir. Because I want those stats, I can search for items with those stats and immediately the shop has pared down to just the relevant pieces of gear. The items that give armor mostly have unique aspects tailored to combating physical damage dealers. And the crucial part is, again, it makes the decisions possible. Presenting 15 options at once is how you get decision paralysis. Presenting three options at once is pretty clean. And lo and behold, the recommended items tab in the league shop is three items at a time. I think that is a good thing. That is, I think, the right amount of decisions to put in front of someone at any given time. Good job to Riot there. Nice thing you can do about this is you can pair these stats across classes. Zonia's is super obvious in what it's about. It's AP and Armory. Banshee's? AP and magic resist. Riley's is an ability power item, and in this case, health becomes a secondary stat that reinforces the item's purpose. Because why would you want to apply a movement speed slow if all you're doing is bursting people in half a second or getting one shot yourself? Secondary stats reinforce the item's purpose. Riley's is about longer fights. Second major thing secondary stats do is another way to add horizontal scaling that feels vertical. As mentioned before, vertical scaling is getting strictly more powerful in all cases, and it feels great. You're harder, better, faster, stronger, your enemies are daft, and you're going to punk them. But armor is, I would say, technically a horizontal scaling. Azir completely ignores armor. Vayne completely ignores magic resist. Some ones are a bit more touchy, but I'm still going to make the case. Attack speed, ability haste, critical strike chance. There's no guarantee you'll use them in a fight. Azir may never get off a second Q or a third W. Annie may kill you in a single combo, and Tibber's going to come back from cooldown before the next fight anyway. So why even have ability haste? Now, I'm not really calling these stats bad. I'm absolutely not doing that. But just that more frequently than attack damage, ability power, or health matter, these secondary stats can go to waste. I would also say that bonus mana is a secondary stat, um, but it's kind of the worst of all because it's useless until you would have run out, which means a secondary stat that doesn't even satisfy the vertical progression fun metric. One thing to point out, though, is that these stats are multiplicative with the main stats of attack damage, ability power, and health. Every point of armor gives you 1% more health against physical damage. 1% of the health you've already got. It's multiplicative. Every point of attack speed makes you attack 1% more often. So the more damage you deal per hit, the more that matters. Some snowballing, of course, is healthy, and I think this is a good place to put it. So I'm pretty happy overall. The third big thing it does is it opens up the opportunity for these stats to become primary stats. Ramus and Malphite have specific offensive outputs that scale from armor. Vayne, Kaisa, and Kogma can somewhat ignore bonus attack damage and sink their teeth into attack speed in, uh, instead. One of the best changes from Season 2021, IMO, was converting Critical Strike Chance into on-hit damage for the Rage Blade crew, so that they can enjoy a whole suite of tools that made sense for them by turning that secondary stat of crit chance into a primary stat of on-hit damage with their other sort of primary stat of attack speed. I thought that was really clever and really cool. Now, I know we talked a bit about mana scaling champions before, and I maintain that mana, just like health regen, is not an inherently interesting or compelling stat. They don't feel very vertical. They kind of feel tacked onto items in a lot of cases, and people, anecdotally, seem to ignore those when considering whether or not an item is efficient or even strong in the first place. So, items do basically two things. First, they add to your champion's core stats. Health, ability power attack damage, they provide similar benefits that are almost always helpful and almost always 100% of the time, but not always. You know, lethality doesn't help wave clear. Attack speed and ability haste don't help burst. I like these suites of stats, the primaries and the secondaries. As you buy more items, you're going to help you know, they're going to help your champion, you're going to pro you're going to progress in these dimensions, and almost regardless of what you choose, you're going to keep getting stronger. In League of Legends, vertical progression is good, and it is fun, and it's most of the power budget of the items you buy, and I think that's a great thing. The second part is the interesting stuff. It's why I constantly push for items to cost the same amount of gold and for them to give the same base stats, because deciding among unique passives and actives is the fun of the system. It's the exciting part of the system. The tailoring between 15 AP but 10 haste is not nearly as compelling as do I get Zonia's or Grievous Wounds. Now, look, briefly, in your components, 
as you're building up to your items, sure, maybe a little bit there, maybe finish Phoenix Codex, maybe you get a Blasting Wand instead, who knows. But the more important part is that the item with the percent health burn on it, or the item with the dash, or the item with the healing reduction, those are the choices you're actually making. Those are the ones you actually care about in your head. The stats behind them are to support the play style and to support the premise of those outputs. And just uh, in case, you know, you're not against champion you counterbuilt, don't worry, you're still getting value out of all that gold you earn because the items always give you some baseline level of power, regardless of whether it was minions or champions that you ruthlessly murdered. So one final summary. It might make sense in other games, but mathing the differences among items to my mind, doesn't have a place in League of Legends because decisions are made in the moment and you don't have time for that. Vertical progression is fun. Every item for every champion should provide a primary stat for its primary class. That is attack damage, that is ability power, or that is health. Every item needs to give one of those three stats, IMO. And cost a relatively similar amount of gold for items meant for that class. Of course, there can be exceptions for exceptional cases, right? Rage Blades for users who prim whose primary stat is attack speed or on hit damage in and of itself. And those, of course, yes, right? Those live outside the lines a little bit. The differences among items should be the fun and interesting parts. Shirelia's is the go fast item, not the health, haste, mana region item. Now, I am a little undecided on whether or not the differences in secondary stats, like the Dead Man's Plate versus Thornmill versus Randuin's stat swap, I'm not sure if that makes decisions better or not. Um, there's also the idea, uh, so sorry, on that side, I'm, I'm generally not a fan, but there might be a reason. I'm not certain of this one. But there's also another idea, which is things like um, secondary stat differences on items like Turbo Chem Tank uh, is, the, is the go fast tank item, but has an MR stack on it. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or not, because it does make you decide, ooh, I can't buy Chain Vest, but I'm against Renekton, but I need to engage the team fights. That is a decision point. I just don't know if it feels too bad. I, I am undecided. I'm not sure. So this ends the sort of scripted part of the video. Um, a quick sort of exit from me. This is my first time trying something like this. Let me know how it went. Um, I want to be really, really clear that these are my opinions. I am not necessarily right just because I wrote a script and have a... Uh, 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 slides up here. Like, I don't know. I'm just a dude. Um, I'll also give a lot of credit where it's due. Um, so just, these are kind of random tangents, um, but I think they're interesting. Um, in the last video that I did, which is all about mana and how I complain about people's mana pools being, um, you know, really distinct for seemingly no good reason. Uh, and I was like, you know, if we just made everyone have the same mana pool, we could, you know, more easily balance items like Mana Mune and Seraph's Embrace. And you know what the easy solution for that is? You make Seraphs just scale off bonus mana so that your champion's base stats don't matter. Which is what, which was, um, which is what, um, what's the item? I just said it. Seraphs does. Mana Moon still scales off your total mana, but uh, Archangel Staff and Seraph scales off bonus mana only. So that item doesn't care about your base stats. I still think you should keep the same base stats the same because how do you know if 860 mana is a meaningful increase in your mana pool when Kassman has 1700 and TF has 600? One of these champions gets a lot more out of the mana pool part of, of, you know, Seraphs, but anyway, still think that should be consistent, but worth pointing out that, you know, sometimes there are really simple solutions out there staring me in the face. That's it for the video. I appreciate you all very much. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.